morning, Mike. Now, you're sounding and looking pretty good, considering how late you were up last night. Uh, yeah, I think I've had about two hours sleep, but that's what <laughs> party conference is all about. Sleep's for wimps. Uh, we were too busy on the karaoke. Yes, and the dancing. I see that you were uh, uh, you and Tom Tugendhat were sort of uh, double timing with uh, Michael Gove. He's quite a mover, Mr. Gove. <laughs> yes, he had us all spinning around the dance floor. Uh, we probably had about six or seven cabinet members on, on our dance floor at our party at in-house communications last night. It was really good fun. Yeah. Uh, there is quite a lot of hard work that goes on at conference. It isn't all party, Mike, I want to assure you. Mm. Oh, listen, I know that your party is almost the, the, the must-have the must invite whenever anybody goes, um, but I'm not sure I've got the strength for it anymore for all this sort of socialising and partying, so that's why I wasn't there. But never mind, I'll catch up with you for lunch one day. Let's talk a little bit about today, because Boris seems to be manoeuvring himself into quite an interesting position, where he said yesterday, you know, you shouldn't expect the government to fix everything for you, which I think is the first proper conservative thing he said for quite a long time. I think that's right, and I think that's something that he's trying to manage expectations. He realises he's only got a few years left until the next election. He cannot possibly get everything done that is on his plate, and so he has to take choices and take priorities, and he can't achieve everything. He, you know, he's turning around saying, look, the state is not meant to be there for you all the time. We did this really strange thing during a once-in-a-lifetime global pandemic where we paid your wages. You cannot rely on us like that in the future. This is time to get back out to work, find new opportunities, find different ways of working uh, and, and, and move on. And I think he's trying to move the Conservative Party away from pandemic politics into what do we stand for and where is the clear you know, guiding line between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party come the next election. And that is the other thing, because as uh, he attempts to move everything away from coronavirus, and thank God for that, by the way, because it's about time, um, he's painting a picture of a sort of high-wage, um, low-tax economy and there's a lot of people who are a bit skeptical about that and I can understand why they're skeptical because I have some skepticism around how you can get there so quickly I've always thought that if you want to move towards that kind of model you need to move there slowly need to ease your foot off the pedal uh, reduce immigration because of course that's what people voted for they wanted controlled immigration and we do have that now you have the control to be able to let in more people if you wish whether or not it's construction whether or not it is in abattoirs whether or not it's in care homes we should be able to bring in people to the country if we need them but indeed not always uh, to suppress wages uh, and not be flooded with too many people if we feel that that's not something that the country wants. That is now in place, except I'm not sure the government is doing that properly yet. I do see where there are kind of many limitations and there are de there's demand that's outstripping supply when it comes to workers. I'm not sure at this time pumping up the minimum wage w while sorting out that problem, or not sorting out that problem yet, uh, is going to come, come to the solution they're looking for. I actually think there's a slow move towards that. And I can see a slight difference between what Rishi Kutsunak has said in his speech this week and what Boris Johnson's planning on saying later on today and I think maybe there might be some upset between the Treasury and number 10 on these issues. Yes indeed because apart from anything else it would seem to me that we found found ourselves in a position of losing um, various workers from the EU uh, and so now we're going to bring them back in it seems to be a bad idea to rely on them again because it'll just leave again and then we'll have another shortage surely it would make more sense to train up the people who are unemployed in this country uh, because there still are quite a lot of people unemployed if we've got all these vacancies why are they not filling them? Well, there's two problems there. First of all, that takes time. Uh, and if you need urgent, if it's a kind of, you know, you need a supply chain problem and we, we need urgent staff and support now, care homes are crying out for people, abattoirs crying out for people, lots and lots of different skilled labour that needs to come in. Um, uh, you need to do that now. And so you can plan for those skills. Don't forget, we've known about things like the HGV shortage as far back as 2016. Mm. So it's, it's OK to say now, oh, we should just be paying people more and training them. But we haven't done enough to replace those foreign workers with our own workers. And the second point there, Mike, is that people don't want to do the jobs. Uh, there are many jobs in this country that people don't want to do. There is a mismatch. There are people out of work and there are over a million jobs available right now. They are not fulfilling those mm. jobs. And it's not always because they are skilled, not skilled to do so. They don't necessarily want those jobs. And that's a problem. It doesn't matter how much, many people you skill up, it doesn't matter how much you pay, that there's going to be a change. It doesn't, doesn't always fix the problem. No, it doesn't. But that's a problem as well that should be able to, to, to be sort of addressed in some way by the government. Because I'm sorry if you don't want a job. But, you know, in America, you get six months unemployment pay and if you don't get a job after that you don't get any more so I mean you know that could be a bit of an incentive couldn't it 
It does, and of course, not everybody that it doesn't work is uh, on unemployment benefit. And then sometimes I'm in one earning families, where one person goes out to work, one person stays at home. So there are, you know, the, the figures are slightly misleading. Mm. I do think there is something about um, the kind of appetite that people have, the, the skills reset. There are a lot of middle-aged people that have been in work, had a great career, and suddenly found themselves without an income after um, the pandemic. Mm. They're coming off a of furlough now. We don't quite know what's going to happen to them. We don't know where they're going to end up. And I think it's right that the government step in with the private sector to offer the right skills, the right training to get them back into work and in a career that they can choose. If you're in your mid 40s, you've got 20, potentially 30 years left in the workplace. You shouldn't be written off yet. No, well, I'm, I can happily say that as somebody who left my 40s behind quite some time ago. But let's talk a bit about Boris and his speech today, because you've been on the other side of the curtain, as it were, fixing up uh, for Theresa May's speeches, uh, which, which were two of the probably worst ever delivered to, to party conference. Although some people quite enjoyed the little dancing that she did when she came on uh, that one time. But when the letters fell off the wall and she had the coughing fit, I mean, you know, you must have been holding your head in your I hands. I was responsible for the one before, Mike. I was responsible for the one before that, <laughs> that no one remembers because it went sm oh, right. swimming. There well. we are then. <laughs> I heard you talking. But I also uh, another, worked with I, Boris. I heard you talking on another station about how you were overruled by people who shall remain nameless uh, about a couple of decisions that, that you were making. Boris today says that he's going to be, or he's, they're, they're saying that he's going to be critical of some of his previous um, uh, prime ministers, including probably Theresa May. I think that's wise. Well, it's bold and he's only got a couple of more years left until the next election. So he better be able to deliver because that's a bit of a worry for Conservatives, MPs I've been speaking to at this conference. They're saying, look, we are, there's a difference between optimism and pessimism and realism. Uh, we've got to make sure that there's lots and lots of things that can be tackled in a quite short space of time. Mm. There are lots of challenges facing this Conservative government coming out of the pandemic. Uh, to be bold and say that previous Prime Ministers didn't get on with a job um, I think that might leave some Conservative MPs a little bit uneasy. Yes, I think so. Because it'll also leave some people, presumably in the hall, a little bit uneasy. I mean, I don't know if Theresa May is going to be queuing up to see Boris if she thinks he's going to be slagging her off. I doubt it very much. I think that they probably leave Boris to it. But of course, Boris is, this is his best moment. He's brilliant at the set piece speeches. He goes out there. This is a rabble raising uh, opportunity to speak to the crowd that went out and knocked on the doors back in 2019 to get him into number 10 behind the black door. And he wants to go and say thank you to them. And the, this, the pandemic was just a moment in time where we had to pause business as usual, but we're back on it. And we're gonna go, go ahead and do the things that the public want us to do. Um, and so he, he will absolutely, it doesn't matter what he says in that hall today, they'll be on their feet clapping and cheering. Oh, well, I mean, as Peter Cardwell was telling us, there's people already queuing up to get in, you know, a full kind of 90 minutes before uh, at least he, he even begins to, to think about speaking. And he does have this incredible um, sort of pulling power for a politician because most politicians nobody really cares about, right? Oh, look, right, right the way back when I was working for Boris Johnson in 2007, 2008, when I ran his London mayoral campaign, um, it was electric. I didn't, I've never worked for a politician before or since that has that connection with voters. They would run across the street. To, it was like a pop star. It was like a celebrity. Um, that's not normal. And, of course, that does spark some forms of jealousy mm. within the Conservative Party because some of the other MPs work really, really hard and don't get anywhere, don't get that kind of connection with the constituents and the voters in the way that he does. So he's really... Um, got a great crowd here while I was still at karaoke last night they were already starting up to queue to get in to go and see him this really? morning it's amazing isn't it and and it, it, when you think about the kind of the situation there's an awful lot of people that I speak to on this on this show uh, a lot of people who call in who say we're never voting Tory again we feel that we've been let down you know the border force isn't working the despite what Pretty Patel said the other day you know the, there's still people landing on beaches it's quietened down a little bit now because it's got a bit colder um, but, you know, they haven't done what they said they would do. And yet he still seems to be getting away with it. Well, when you see the polling, what people are slightly grumpy about is the Conservative government not quite delivering on what they said they were going to do, but having some understanding that the pandemic was a once-in-a-lifetime moment. But that, that criticism doesn't really sit at Boris Johnson's door. He has this Teflon-like ability to kind of separate himself almost from 29 years out of 42 or 43 of Conservative rule. He's brilliant at keep on reinventing himself. In London, as London Mayor, he was quite pro-immigration. He's about to stand up on the stage today and talk to you about how we must keep a lid 
lid on immigration and that's been kind of the root of all evil mm. in the last decade and how David Cameron was, was at fault for that and Theresa May mm. so he's got this amazing flexibility to move around each issue it's whether or not the public finally some, at some point get fed up with that or they keep on going on that journey with him well it doesn't really help does it that there's no opposition and Keir Starmer in the Labour Party conference was an absolute shambles compared to this I mean this has appeared to look like from the outside anyway a relatively smooth run operation Oh, very much so. And uh, but you know, I think the Conservatives are just grateful to be back. We're grateful to be here. We didn't know if this conference was going to actually go ahead earlier on this year. So there's been lots of networking, lots of op opportunities to meet new people, recognise some old faces, meet some new friends, uh, and uh, it's been really busy and quite lively. And I think it's like, hugely optimistic. I wonder if we're here back in in 12 months' time, whether or not they'll still have that air of optimism and, and enthusiasm, mm. or whether or not that it starts to bite yeah. as we go, go forward towards a general election. Well, I think as you say Boris does have this ability to kind of reinvent himself every so often it's almost like he he sheds his skin like a snake and becomes something slightly different and nowadays uh, he appears to be looking headlong into changing not just the Tory party but the whole country I mean he's been talking about you know transforming the country into a different place taking it forward I mean do you see this as as him kind of trying to make out we're entering a new era I think so. He wants to, this to be the Boris era. When he took over as mayor, London mayor, he didn't want to Kellingston kind of uh, era to carry on. He wanted to have the Boris bikes. He wanted to have that identity that linked him to the, the things that he wanted mm. to do in London. And I think that's very much a case of what he wants to do now. I call Boris Johnson the morph. Do you remember morph? I don't know if that's an age thing. Not everybody <laughs> quite remembers the morph of British politics. Yeah. He can always mould himself into any scenario and come out on top and yeah. continue to do so. And how different is it uh, in terms of the atmosphere in the in the government would you say from when you were with Theresa May I think it has changed quite dramatically. Um, there's always infighting between the silos in government. They don't work smoothly together. The system is actually quite broken. I didn't really like Dominic Cummings and what he did at number 10, but I agreed with him on some of the things he said. Not all of them, but some of them about the system of government mm. that does need reform. And maybe Michael Gove and some of the other reformers within the government uh, under Boris Johnson will go ahead uh, and make some of those changes. But I do think it's more collegiate. I think that they're working together. They're rowing in the right direction. The private office is Side number 10 seems to be working quite well at the moment um, and uh, you know they know that they've got a big challenge but they've got the party on their side and so there'll be MPs in that hall today that will be on their feet cheering for Boris Johnson because they know that he makes them electable that they can have a potentially long time in their seat to make the changes they need they go and campaign for investment in their area he's someone that wants to spend more I'm not sure Rishi uh, quite agrees with him but he's someone that wants to spend more and um, you know they, they were proud to, to sit under Boris Johnson and, and get, let him lead their government and so I actually think that at the moment he's riding not high not only in the public polls but also within his own party mm. uh, and that's reflecting quite well behind the scenes as well yeah and I think people like somebody who is popular. I mean, it looks better for everybody. Stay where you are, Casey, if you will, just for a moment. We're going to come back to you with a couple of quick, quick, quick fire questions. Casey, as a businesswoman and as a um, uh, uh, someone who knows an awful lot of, of high flyers in the business world, Boris today, we think, is also going to say it's time to everybody, uh, for everybody to get back to work uh, and to stop working from home. Um, how has that affected business, do you think? And where is business right now in terms of sort of full capacity? I think it has affected business, but it's very much uh, industry by industry, sector by sector. Mm. So I think employers have been sensible on the whole around what they ne their needs are, but also we've changed. So in my office, we used to be nine to five or even later, but we were Monday to Friday. And now we are in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. We give the, we empower the staff to make the choices around the client needs that they have. And I think that's, that's made them feel trusted. Um, I've never felt that they've, uh, you know, swung the lead a bit or done something that they shouldn't have done uh, and so we have a really kind of happy workforce and a balanced workforce what I do think is that when I interview people they turn up and they say as part of the interview process what's your work flexible working like I really want to work flexibly mm. and that's a challenge for employers because not every employer can do that and not every employer can can you know trust the fact that a large workforce everybody's doing what they said they're going to do so it, it's flexible for small businesses when you've got your eyes in your employers and you, you know where they're at that's fine. For a big 
corporates, that's a challenge. And of course, the Prime Minister is also going to stand up today and talk about the idea of minimum wage prices moving. Yeah. If care homes can't secure the staff at the moment, how are they possibly going to be able to afford it on things like minimum wage increases? Mm. So it's okay for employers like me, who uh, you know have got skilled labour and uh, our staff are not on, not on minimum wage, so that won't ma make much difference. But for some other organisations, they will have a bit of a sore head today and they'll think, Conservative Party, I thought the Conservative Party was the party of business, the party of wealth creators. They're making it harder for us, not easier for us to do that. And I think there is some concern uh, amongst business leaders today yeah. about that. And while obviously people would want to see the minimum wage going up and people making a better living and making more money, that's going to have a knock-on effect on prices. We're already told this morning that the average family um, sort of household bill is going to go up about £1,800 in a year. That's an awful lot of money. It's a huge amount of money. This winter, people are going to be choosing between eating and heating. Uh, and it's all right for people at the Conservative Party conference who turn up in their nice cars and their nice suits talking about money and not really having care in the world. They don't know the price of things in the supermarket. They don't know about what it's like to budget uh, for a family. Mm. There's so many people in this country as well that are the working poor. They go to work. They are busting their gut. They're offering, often holding down more than one job. And yet... They are poor. They do not have. They can't afford the holidays unless they're on credit cards. If the exhaust falls off the car, they can't afford to fix it. And I think the Conservative Party needs to show they understand those people at home who are going to be struggling this winter uh, and under the price um, crunch that you just mentioned. Mm. Well, that's right. And also, he's still pushing on with this green energy agenda, isn't he? He still wants to be the kind of the man that that turned the world green. He wants to be the guy that everybody looks to uh, from every other country in the world as the man who did it first. And that's paying, he's making people pay a high price for that in terms of the pound in their pocket. And that's where the crunch comes with uh, his Chancellor Rishi Sunak, because Rishi uh, sees uh, the Green Agenda as something else on the kind of budget book, uh, another line that he has to think about. He's not absolutely bought in in the way that Boris Johnson is bought into this, because he has lots of other competing mm. financial priorities. And so I think that that might be the issue as we run up to the COP conference in November in Glasgow, uh, might be the issue that is causing some frictions between the two. I think there's lots to admire Boris Johnson for, for his Green Agenda, for his real push. Uh, on making sure that we don't keep on polluting the planet and we make sensible choices but they have to be affordable choices so many families still can't afford an electric car have live nowhere near electric charging point can't afford to heat their homes all the time are choosing what hours of the day to heat their homes because they need to be able to afford to feed their children at the same time these are things issues that are you know really pressing and mm. they're only going to get worse well you know what a lot of people are doing that i'm hearing about uh, is they're, they're finding out whether they've got a chimney uh, and a fireplace in the house that might have been covered up and they're opening them up uh, so, that, so whatever he thinks is going to be happening as a result of his uh, challenge to go green, people are going to start burning stuff in a fireplace. Yeah, but that's really dangerous too and more polluting. And of course, if you do want a fireplace at home, you're meant to get a license from your local council to do so. Mm. Um, and so there's a possibility that we're going to make matters worse, not better. It's like when um, local councils started charging for uh, making you, you leave your rubbish out or um, a sofa out or something to come and take it away or charging you for garden waste. Yeah. We saw a massive increase in fly tipping. Yeah. So, you know, all of these good ideas sometimes can have terrible unintended consequences and knock-on effects. But that's the problem as well. But we're also hearing that there's a sort of stealth tax coming that council taxes are going to go up by quite a large amount and that is going to be how the Tories pay for quite a lot of stuff. I think there is a real genuine pressure on living standards and this kind of talk about rising wages which I don't think happens overnight which I think is a steady slow progressive thing that the Conservative Party needs to be able to champion and campaign for and, and, and talk to business about I'm worried that actually that you know that's 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 in the future that's not tomorrow and so tomorrow people are facing real terms crunch on their finances there lots and lots of costs are coming in uh, there's gonna be a difficult winter if um, they've spent all of lockdowns inside and they're going out again it's li highly likely they might need a GP appointment because they're picking up all kinds of different germs uh, they can't get a GP appointment. They're turning up in their droves to A&E uh, and the pressures are on. There are serious public service pr pressures on this summer uh, going into the winter. We saw uh, binmen aren't able to pick up the rubbish because a there's a shortage of HGV drivers and some of them went on strike as well. So I think there's kind of the winter of discontent people talk about isn't as far fetched as you might think. And mm. I think there's some real pressures for Boris Johnson. Yeah. And that, I suppose, is, is where the crux of the matter lies, isn't it? Because uh, there you are up in Manchester, you know, everybody's going to be cheering to the rafters today. He's going to be talking about this world, which is kind of in his head, as opposed to the one that's actually going on around him in the street. 
Well, Penny Mordaunt, um, a minister in his government, spoke yesterday. She said the difference in politics at the moment is the Labour Party that's pessimistic about the future and a Boris Johnson-led government that is optimistic about the future. The problem with that is, is that it's just words and you've got to be able to deliver on that optimism uh, and that enthusiasm. You can't just talk about it. And in politics, people get sick about politicians just talking and not doing. And Boris Johnson knows that because when he went for a second term as London Mayor um, uh, to, to fight uh, against Ken Livingstone, um, he, he, well, I don't know, 2019, 20, sorry, 2021, yeah. um, he, he turned around, sorry, a little bit earlier before that, he turned around and said to people, look, I, I, I had a legacy in my first four years. Uh, in, in, in London uh, and I want to finish the job that I started that's going to be very similar Boris Johnson knows if he wants to take this party into the next election he needs a legacy he needs something to show for it he needs to make sure he's built more homes he's become more green he's managed to raise living standards things like that and so he knows he's running out of time so he can't just talk he's got to start delivering yeah. well I mean we can go back to the old it's the economy stupid can't we if he gets that right a lot of people will vote for him because they'll be happy, they'll have money in their pockets and they won't be uh, terrified of losing their home. But as Boris Johnson has pointed out today in some of the kind of words he's released ahead of his speech, the government cannot control everything. I think Robert Colville wrote mm. in the Sunday Times at the weekend that the, the kind of big secret in government is that it can't control everything. It doesn't, you know, what levers it has to push and pull are more limited than the general public might think. The petrol crisis is one example of that. You know, the dithered around bringing in the army, one way or another, I don't think the army's going to make much difference. It's a supply and demand issue. And so the government can't fix everything. So it may well be that there are some bold promises and it may well be that, that Michael Gove and other real reformers within Boris Johnson's team do make some significant progress. But when the government looks, or the, when the public looks to the government to solve everything, um, I think that that's a danger, a very dangerous place to be because it can't. Hmm. And so I think it's very sensible for Boris to kind of set up that stall earlier. He's doing what they, we say in politics as managing expectations. Yeah, I think that's right. Casey, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for getting up so early uh, after being up so late. And uh, we'll see you soon. Casey Perrier, uh, former Director of Communications at Number 10, worked with Theresa May, worked with Boris Johnson, of course, looking ahead to his big speech. Uh, and the difference that he's going to make today uh, is really all about whether he can deliver what he says he wants to do.